And since you did such a good job of it last month, would you mind um, doing the call off for introductions? Sure. I appreciate uh, it. No problem. Um, I guess I'll start. My name is Ashley Bone. I work in the Civil Rights Department in the Labor Standards Enforcement Division. Um, the next person is a, a number ending in 8110. Yeah, that's Kate Davenport. Hi, Kate. And then your organization? Eureka Recycling and Main Street Alliance. Awesome. And Elise? Hi, Elise Diedrich from Target. Awesome. Aaron Henderson? Hello, everyone. Aaron Henderson uh, from Climb Higher. Andy Snow? <laughs> Hey, I'm Andy Snow, and I'm from the Sex Workers Outreach Project. Awesome. Anna, or Anna, excuse me. Hi, yep, Anna Schmitz from Fair State Brewing Cooperative. Sorry, my dog's in the background. Eric? Hello, Eric Beaudry with Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. Brian Elliott? Hi, Brian Elliott with the SEIU Minnesota State Council. Chelsea. Chelsea Glabitz, president at the Minneapolis Regional Labor Federation. Ginger. Hi, I'm Ginger. I'm here representing 15 now. Davis. Yep, sorry. Um, Davis Sensman uh, with Davis Law Office and Main Street Alliance. So, Madeline. Hi. Madeline Lohman with the Advocates for Human Rights. <clears throat> Natalie. Hi, Natalie Martin, small business bookkeeper. Frank. Hello, everyone. Frank Ree, interim director of the Civil Rights Department. Um, Veronica. Hi, I'm Veronica Mendez Moore, co director of CETO. Um, Gia. Good afternoon. Gia Vitale with Mayor Fry's office. Wade. Hey everybody, Wade with Unite here and the hospitality union and I'm going to excuse myself at about 430. I've got another call. Okay, no problem. And Brian. Brian Walsh, Civil Rights Department. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Ashley. I had you do that last month because I I'm just having issues with Microsoft Teams on my computer, so it's hard to do the call out on your um, phone when you have Microsoft Teams up. So um, why don't we hop right in and go to uh, Frank for the um, Civil Rights Department update and the Hospitality Worker Right to Recall update, since I know Frank has to go. Is that okay for you, Aaron, to go to you after Frank? Absolutely, that works. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Frank. Hello, everybody. I mean, I'll I'll be brief. Um, I want to start with some some bad news. Um, well, maybe it's not bad news, but it's news. Um, so I'm going to be leaving the city uh, effective tomorrow. In fact, I know. So, um, but no, there's there's good news here on the other end of this. Uh, Mani Jafar, who is at the head of our OPCR uh, division in the um, department, is going to be taking over for me as interim. Uh, she's a, a, a former legal aid attorney, um, and she's about the work. Um, Strong-minded, super wicked intelligent. She's about getting it done. Um, I think she's going to move the, the department work forward. And she's going to create that relationship uh, uh, between uh, the WAC and the department and make it stronger and, and move all this important historic work forward. So um, I'm encouraged. I'm happy that she's the one that's coming on and start doing that work. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a, a heavy heart. Um, I believe in, in everything that, that this group is doing. Uh, in, in favor of the workers in the city of Minneapolis. It's needed, it's historic, it's something that is substantial, and at the end of the day, um, you are making a difference in people's lives. And that's really what all of this is about. Everything that the department stands for 
and all of you, as it turns out as well, uh, is about making people's lives better. And and uh, I applaud you all. And this work is going to get done. It'll continue. Um, and I haven't fallen off the, the edge of the world either. Um, I will make sure that that Brian has the uh, my contact information. Um, and I welcome calls from any one of you in, in an effort to, to stay in contact. So I've, I've found my, myself enriched by being able to, to, to work with you all and, and to appear and, um, in your meetings and to meet the folks that you represent. And, um, and that's the honest truth, um, which is rare in this world, right? <laughs> There's so much going on. But I can honestly say that that I, I feel that down to my soul. So thank you all uh, very much. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll start talking a little bit about the recall ordinance. It, it went live on May 1. Um, and so um, Brian worked very hard to get the FAQs out so that people can be empowered with knowledge about how it works um, and what the focus is. And I guess, um, Brian, I'm not sure if we've received anything in, in relation to that. I haven't had a chance to check in with you, but if you want to give a, a, a short um, on summation of, of what we've uh, found so far, that would be helpful. Yeah, uh, like Frank said, we got the FAQ. We scrambled, but got the FAQs, and I think a good um, a good final product on those and, and was were able to get them kind of published publicly before they were effective so that we could get some feedback and i was able to circle back with wade thank you so much for your collaboration on all of this uh, obviously it wouldn't have occurred without your advocacy um but those are uh those are out and public we have a website we blasted them out um to all of our email subscribers and then i also worked with business licensing to I think find um, the email contact information for every single licensed entity that is covered by the ordinance, um, which is obviously really helpful. It's a little bit of a smaller universe that's uh, regulated under this one. Everyone will, will remember that it's hotels and event centers of uh, larger size, most of which are located down town and it's not a, a giant massive number of them so i think i was able to reach out to all of them by email and send them uh the faqs directly then uh we also did a couple of press releases and we're sitting back and i haven't heard um a ton haven't received a ton of questions on on the ordinance yet which is not shocking but we're hopeful uh, we're hopeful that everyone is is tuned in and will will comply with the requirements So with that, uh, that concludes the uh, report from the department. Does anyone has any any questions? Thank you, Brian. Uh, for for Brian or for Frank, uh, Brian, how big was that universe? How many how many licensees were there on the app? Yeah, and I as I said that, Wade, I I remembered. I promised to circle back and and make sure that we covered everyone. I will send you an email. Um, I would have to go back and look. I think the spreadsheet had, well, if you give me a, a moment, actually, I could pull it up real quick. But off the top of my head, I want to say maybe 40, 45, 50, somewhere in that range. But let me um, keep going and I'll interrupt to tell you the precise count. Well, no, I, that was really kind of in the realm of what we were thinking. Uh, and right. So, you know, again, just not that not that onerous to keep track of or to start keeping track of and and uh, um, and these employers know how to do it they just need to do it so right uh, thank you for all the work again there in the office it's uh, really much appreciated I had a question um, do you have a sense Brian or Wade of what percentage of those are union and non-union uh, I could I can share. I think we're four, 14 of those were should be union proper. No, that's probably not right. 18, 18 to 20 of those are union properties. OK, so a half are not. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so that so um, Veronica, that would be um, inclusive of, you know, our the, the sports facilities. 
the major sports facilities, of course, the convention center. Um, we may have ca captured one or two other large event centers. Uh, and then um, the uh, we have 14 union hotels. That's great. I'm just really curious to see and, and like and think about and, and maybe Wade, we can talk offline about it, but like what what happens with all the non-union places where you know the employers are likely to be less likely to follow it. Um, and mm -hmm. so yeah, just thinking about what does outreach look like to workers and things, but we it's probably something we can put offline. Agreed. Yep. Yeah, and, and thanks, Veronica. That's a great point. I'm going to add that to my note in addition to email to Wade, maybe email to the both of you. Um, because I, I think, yeah, that I follow up from the department specifically to the non unionized properties. Um, it would, or yeah, follow up and additional communication is probably warranted. And Wade, maybe you can help me narrow down and figure out exactly which ones are union versus non union. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks all. Um, I apologize. My I did get the teams working again on my computer. Um, so I did miss uh, when when will um, the new interim director be able to join us next month? You're you're uh, muted, Frank. Sorry about that. You think I would have figured that out by now? Um, uh, so it's it's my understanding that um, um, she will take over officially uh, tomorrow. Is my understanding uh, as the interim role, so she will be ready uh, to appear before this body uh, on the, at the next meeting next month. Well, I just uh, personally want to say thank you. It, I mean, I know we've only met over Zoom. We've never gotten to meet in person at the uh, city hall uh, headquarters, but um, it's been really great to get to know you and your advocacy for this committee has resulted in change and um, has resulted in bettering the life for workers. So I really have appreciated your time with us over this last year. Is that right? Year? Almost a year. Um, Almost a year. So, so I've really appreciated that and I hope you uh, give uh, your predecessor, your interim predecessor here, um, good advice about how to uh, work with this committee. I appreciate that. It's in the making. She's ready to go, though. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good luck in your next endeavor. I appreciate it. Well, you we will good. meet up uh, face to face. We'll good. I'm sure we will at some point. <laughs> Maybe I'll come to one of your meetings as a as a as a regular citizen. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> Good, good. Thanks. Okay, we have another guest here, um, Aaron from Climb Hire Organization. Hello, friends. Quick, quick question. Um, am am I uh, able to do a quick screen share just to to um, add my PowerPoint to the conversation? Yeah, I think that's fine. Go right ahead, Aaron. Let's do it. Thank you. If you can do the technology end of it, you are more than allowed. Yeah, that's the that's the scary part, right? <laughs> Uh, one sec. There we go. Can folks see this? Yep, you're yep. good. Mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Henderson. I am the director of outreach and admissions for Climb Higher, um, and just want to talk to you all a little bit about my org today. Um, give you all the breakdown on what it is we actually do, and then hopefully, um, if I pique anybody's interest, I will drop my uh, email in the chat. If anyone wants to follow up with further conversation, would be happy to do so. Or if anyone wants to share information, brochures, or literature about our organization, happy to share that with you. So, um, Climb Higher. Uh, just kind of just so I can orient everybody in the space is a uh, upskilling organization uh, located originally in the Bay. Um, that, that is where we started. Um, but now in this beautiful digital world, um, we can be everywhere. So uh, we started about two years ago. Uh, and like I said, we're an upskilling organization. But upon closer inspection, um, I like to say that we are a community of career seekers uh, looking to help 
people break out of jobs and into careers, specifically in the tech industry. Um, and so what we do is we teach um, learning tracks and we teach uh, hard skills coupled with soft skills to, pre to prepare uh, working adults uh, for a career in tech. Uh, and we utilize um, social equity um, by hosting a lot of virtual events um, for folks to meet different executives from uh, you know, our various partner organizations, as well as connecting uh, Climb Hire alumni to current climbers um, to build a growing, bubbling community of referrals and connectivity uh, to have people break into these opportunities. Um, our founder uh, originally worked for LinkedIn, and during her time at LinkedIn, she realized that you're nine times more likely to secure a job through a, refer a referral than you would other otherwise. Uh, and we know here at Climb Higher that you know talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And so, really, what we look to do is prepare folks. Um, you know, the phrase, it's not, it's not uh, what you know, it's who you know. Well, we at Climbire really want to teach you what to know uh, and who to know. So we teach a Salesforce administrator track. And the reason that we teach Salesforce for folks who are familiar with Salesforce is that 99 of the, of the Fortune 100 companies uh, utilize uh, Salesforce um, uh, cloud database uh, for a lot of things that they have going on with their company. And we've realized through this learning track, it's been extremely applicable um, to having folks break in uh, at an entry level position. So a quick snapshot of the folks who we serve. Uh, again, like I said, we are serving young adults uh, roughly between the ages of 22 and 33. Um, the majority of our climbers, I would say a little bit over 50% uh, don't have a college degree. You are not required to have a college degree to be part of our program. Uh, we are looking for overlooked and hidden talent. Uh, as you know, you know, the tech industry um, suffers with a lack of diversity, uh, but we know a lot of folks who are overlooked and hidden uh, tend to be communities of color. Uh, and again, this is just based on opportunity. And so uh, more than 90 percent of uh, our of the folks that we serve do come from communities of color. And um, they're either employed full time, part time uh, or some folks are unemployed. So. Again, upskilling organization, right? Um, looking to give you the tangible skills that you need to break into the tech industry. Um, our Salesforce administrative track, um, had, we're going on our cohort number four. So this is what we're recruiting our, our fourth cohort. Um, but we've experienced a lot of success uh, with the folks who have come through our program already. 80% of the folks who have come through our program have secured a position, um, either doubling or tripling their salary within the first six months upon programs completion. And so again, we've only been around for two years, experiencing a lot of success. And with that, 80% uh, of those folks landing those positions, the other 20% continue to work with us uh, until we are able to secure uh, a position for them. Folks are, who are going through the Salesforce administrative track are taking on all sorts of amazing positions. Um, they can go directly into Salesforce and, and Salesforce administrator job, um, a cuts, customer success associate or business analyst, just to name a few. Um, and a lot of times employers may not even be looking for them to actually take on a Salesforce specific job, um, but based on a lot of the skills and the referrals that they get through our program can land a completely different position um, just by going through our program. Our program, our program components consist of 150 hours of technical learning. So um, getting back to that hard skills that I was telling you about that we like to teach, um, utilizing our Salesforce platform, uh, these classes happen in the evening and folks are able to engage um, with our instructors and, and with the Salesforce database um, in the evenings twice a week for three hours um, to complete that 150 hours of technical coursework. They also will be participating in a lot of role-playing and project-based work. So not only are they gonna be uh, learning um, you know, through, through Salesforce and from our instructors, but they're also gonna be able to have opportunity to try on some of the things that they are learning um, through role-playing and through project-based work. One of those um, project-based assignments is a capstone assignment um, in which we teach uh, contact tracing, right? And so thinking about the pandemic and how important contact tracing has been, uh, folks are able to create their own contact tracing app, which is really cool. And uh, these are 
these are given to the climbers through a kind of like a homework assignment. So they're able to work on this on their own. Uh, and upon each homework assignment submission, climbers are giving a are given a $75 stipend um, to compensate folks for their time, right? So again, um, you know, regardless of uh, their employment situation, whether they're full-time, part-time or unemployed, uh, we wanna make sure that we're compensating climbers um, upon homework completion. And that $75 stipend can go towards you know, improved Wi-Fi or fixing their laptop or anything that they need uh, to help them through the process. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, really our secret sauce is, is our development of the social capital of our climbers through signature events. Um, you know, a lot of um, uh, career fairs, virtual career fairs where uh, executives um, really wanna get to know our climbers because they believe in our mission. And then also an opportunity for them to have connectivity with climbers who have already gone through the program. So our climbing alum, who like to return at, uh, to our organization as fellows in a near peer capacity and mentor the up and coming climbers. So again, on that near peer um, connectivity piece, um, climbers who have come through our program are able to come back as fellows. The cool thing about this is that our fellows are given a stipend um, and this stipend again encourages you know, them to come back and connect with the climbers, but most of them would do this, a lot of this work for free because they've gone through the program and they know what it takes. Uh, and they also wanna see the success of folks who are coming behind them. So of our, cohort, of, of our last cohort three, again, like I said, we're working on cohort four. We had 25 fellows come back uh, and assist in that capacity. And they go to breakout spaces, talk through any issues that uh, the current climbers are going through. Um, help them with their Salesforce uh, homework assignments uh, and, and really give them a lot of confidence that they too can do it, right? Like if, you know, a couple months ago that climbing alum was a barista at Starbucks and now they're working as a business analyst at IBM, you know, by being in that space, they're able to kind of say, hey, you know, I did exactly what it was you were doing a couple months ago and now look where I am. So a really, really good opportunity for folks to kind of just build their confidence and, and see uh, what's on the other side of the program. And so our program actually costs nothing to participate in, um, which is really cool. We don't want money to be a burden uh, for someone taking advantage of uh, what we have to offer. The way that our model works is we have something called a pay it forward model, which essentially once you complete um, the training program and you've secured a job making 45K or more, you are gonna be paying it forward for the cohort behind you, right? So you'll be paying $150 a month for four years to cover your pay it forward costs. All right, and some ways that you're able to reduce this cost is by coming back as a fellow and being a near peer mentor, which a lot of our climbers decide to do, opting out of your weekly stipends. Uh, as I said, when you turn in a homework assignment, you get your $75 weekly stipend, you can forego that cost, or by referring climbers um, into an actual job opportunity. So these are, these are um, really cool ways for folks to just reduce their costs coming through the program. But one thing that I really like is that you're not asked to start your pay it forward until you've secured a job, right? So the, the proof is really in the pudding and we want you to have succeeded first before ever thinking about um, the pay it forward. So just a quick snapshot of the application process. Um, it's, it is a four phase process, but that's strategic to make sure that the folks who are uh, being interviewed are the right candidates for the program. First step, really just a regular application, uh, a little bit about yourself. If you make it on to the next round, you're going to be doing an asynchronous uh, um, video style interview. Uh, where you're simply just answering some simple questions on camera. If you move to the third step, this is when you will have an opportunity to do some Salesforce work. Um, a lot of times folks see Salesforce administrator and are not really sure what they're getting into. And step three really gives them a snapshot of some of the um, computer abilities that one would have to be successful in the program. Uh, it's not too difficult, but we do want people to be familiar with what it is that they'll be doing. And then lastly uh, is an application uh, workshop where, where we bring you back in a group space, ask you about how the interview process was, why you wanna be a climber, uh, and really get a, a snapshot of your personality in a group uh, setting. And so here are some successes um, of folks who've come through our organization showing kind of where they've started off. And then after going through our org where they where they, they are now, obviously I couldn't 
put all our all of our successes on one on one sheet, but just wanted to highlight a couple of folks. Thank you. Then, oh. Yeah, this is the last page. I mean, these are these are some of our employer partners, and they're growing every day. Um, you know, I know some people might be driving on this call, might not be able to see my PowerPoint, so I'm happy to talk this through. But I just wanted to give a, a little snapshot of some of the companies that we are working with currently. But thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate this. And what is the relationship between um, this project and the city? So we are looking to make a footprint in Minnesota right now. Um, we, Like I said, we were in the Bay, uh, originally started in the Bay. We've just started uh, reaching out in Colorado. And then now we're trying to make our way into Minnesota and let people know all the amazing things that we have going on. So we're looking to create partnership currently. We're looking to create pipelines currently. So we figured this would be an opportunity for us to you know, just get our name out there and see if there's opportunity anywhere for us to kind of reach our target demographic for our program. Well, we really appreciate you being here and um, providing this information. Does anyone on the committee have any questions? Hi, Aaron. This I have a question for you. Um, I saw at the beginning of your presentation, you started with you like to um, particularly, you, you mentioned retail as some of the workers that you like to work with. Um, is there a particular reason that you're focused on that group or is it broader or is it anyone who can apply for your program? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we've just realized a lot of folks who are in retail, um, kind of in these gig style jobs where, you know, there's not no, no real opportunity for growth are the folks who um, can be successful in our program because we're really just trying to start uh, a new career trajectory for folks, right? Um, if there's If someone's in a job and it doesn't feel like there's any sort of upward mobility, um that's the person for our program and do they get and um so when they go in and you said it's i, th I think you said it was 150 hours or something and then is it actual certificate then that they would go forward with out of the program yeah so you are prepared to um to get your salesforce certificate right so you get prepared uh to take that certification it's not a guarantee that you're going to pass it We've had people, um, I, I think right now we're, we're looking at about 70% success rate uh, with folks coming through our program and people are continuing to take the, the certification test, but we've been able to place people in the jobs without them having become Salesforce certified. Uh, a lot of times folks are going directly into something that's Salesforce related. They can use that certificate, but for other folks, um, simply just completing uh, the process, they've been uh, hired that way. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I'm just as uh, uh, um, we're always looking at different ways to continue to build in programs for upskilling because right. it's important, you know, to there's on the job training, but then there's that upskilling or continuing, you know, two year call or, you know, tuition or whatever the individual needs to continue to grow and upskill and or look towards a job outside of where they're currently working. So um, just always interesting to hear different opportunities or what is out there for particularly in the tech space, as you mentioned, um, do you, have you ever considered partnering with, uh, reach, I saw the companies on there, there were some tech companies and, and others. Um, do you partner with retailers on this? Um, currently, no, we, I mean, we, the majority of our partnerships have been um, tech uh, partnerships, tech company uh, partnerships. And I'm also not responsible for some of the, the partnership cultivation on my end. So um, we have not currently, not to say we wouldn't, Great. Thanks for the presentation today. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? All right. So um, we have um, thank you, Aaron, for joining us and um, welcome to the Minneapolis sphere <laughs> from the Bay. <laughs> we uh, appreciate it. Um, Next up on the agenda are general member organization updates. Does anyone have organizational updates to share? I have an update. Um, this is Anna. I, uh, Fair State is working together with Main Street Alliance to put on a uh, meeting, a Zoom meeting on June 10th. At 11 a.m., I'll share an every action link in the chat um, with the goal of getting small business folks, so both workers and owners um, and unions aligned on 
small business priorities around public safety um, in advance of the conversations around public safety that are going to be happening in the months to come. And just kind of with the vision that like, regardless of who's in control of the Minneapolis Police Department after November, it'll be great to be aligned on what kind of public safety priorities uh, workers and unions have in mind for themselves. So I will share that link right now. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other organizational updates? And Anna, I owe you a call back. I got underwater in my emails and somebody pointed that <laughs> It's all good. Don't call worry. You, so I will. <clears throat> All right, so we have. I see on the agenda, Brian put on here the public employee seat is still vacant. I had forwarded the application on to somebody who was interested in applying. So, is there a portal open, or do they have to go directly to you? Um, I think they have to come straight to us right now. I don't believe it's actually open and live, but we can help that happen. Ashley, am I right? about that i don't think it's i don't i can't really remember i don't think it's open right now but you can just have them simply send their completed application to um to myself yeah let me forward it again and if, if we have one person interested in the public employee seat but if there's other folks who are interested let us know mm -hmm. was there another reason that it was on the agenda just besides the fact that it was empty no, just just that it's empty. Just to okay. kind of flag it for everyone, um, that it's it's still empty. Not a, you know, we're actually doing great with our participation. It's only one empty seat. Um, but just to kind of flag it again for everyone. And Chelsea, if you want to connect any potential applicant, um, that you think would be a good fit, if you want to connect them directly to me and Ashley by email, I can help kind of like, um, yeah, help them apply. Yeah, because when you go to the website, you can't go through a portal you have to you can't go through the normal portal right now so right it, it can be frustrating I'm here to help okay uh the downtown workers council hi <clears throat> um yeah so I can give um a little bit of an update on where where things are at um and uh, yeah, and just kind of where things are headed. So, you know, one of the things that the, the, the Downtown Workers Council was really excited about was the right to recall, um, you know, and while it was uh, HERE that did the heavy lifting, that's something that we're super excited about as well. Um, it was one of the things that we were support, the, the Downtown Workers Council was supporting passing. Um, uh, a couple of other pieces that were high priorities were around masks and training um, for workers around COVID safety protocols. So I think, in 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 light of the governor's new, you know, sort of things are going to open up pretty quickly. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, we need to we need to discuss it, but I think there's a little bit like, you know, we're not going to need. There's going to be a point where people aren't wearing masks to work. Um, there's going to be a point pretty soon where people are um, the the safety protocols are not going to exist anymore. And so, um, and so prioritizing. Uh, those two things have been priorities and specifically the priority around not just the work the city does to make it happen, but having the employer have a responsibility for it, right? We've talked about this before, um, but I'll say for for new folks that it was important to workers that, you know, if people are legally required to mer wear a mask in order to do their job, their employer should provide them the mask. And that shouldn't be um, the burden on the worker to figure out how to get a mask, to figure out how to get an, an like a high quality appropriate mask. And like we've named before, we've seen people with just whatever like bandana or like other masks that are not what the CDC is, has told us is like the, the safest kind of mask to be wearing because people were trying to figure it out themselves. Um, and then the other piece around training and, and requiring employers um, to uh, requiring all workers to be trained um, around their, their COVID safety. So that's what we have been talking about. Um, I think we, you know, I spoke with, with Gia earlier today from the mayor's office um, about uh, about doing some work to make sure that uh, even still in this moment, to make sure that employers 
um, that the city is providing employers with masks and uh, that there's that there's public messaging around employers should be giving their workers masks um, in order to do their jobs and like doing some some sort of public work with that messaging um, and also that they should be providing trainings. Uh, one thing I named to to Gia um, and I think is will require more sort of follow up um, down the road and like more input from the downtown workers council workers is that uh, it's become clear that the tr on the training front um, while we have been talking specifically about COVID safety because that's just sort of the most urgent and problematic situation what we've realized in a lot of the outreach with people is that there is a lot of train important training that needs to happen that hasn't happened so like just before the pandemic when we did a survey of downtown workers um, we found that about 50 percent of workers didn't know that they had access to earn sick and safe time and that was you know at that point earn sick and safe time had already been years you know already rolled out years ago um so i, I think it's i don't know I, I can't like speak to any statistic on what that is today um but that's a significant problem and then when the pandemic hits then it's like oh my god this becomes like an incredible crisis people don't even know they have access to safe time and so we're, we're wanting to think a little bit with the downtown workers council about training and what what is still needed even as the pandemic shifts into a different mode that hopefully becomes safer for all of us but like still um being concerned about the safety of downtown workers um as the economy reopens and then even after everything is open just to con still having some concerns about training and safety and wanting to have more conversations about what really is needed in order to make sure that workers are safe in downtown um so that's so that's some of the main pieces of where we're at and, and the conversations that have been happening um the the other piece is around quarantine pay that was one of the issues that workers had lifted up um was thinking about what's happening at a state level around quarantine pay and wanting to make sure that we can have that at a city level even if it doesn't move on a state level or even if only parts of it move on a state level so i don't know if we want to like jump into that or if i should come back to that when we get there um should i, I, jump I, that or? I, 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 transition. I was just putting in the um i think that's a great transition i was just putting in the chat that i have to move to phone only here um and brian walsh had uh, agreed to help facilitate the end of the, the this call, but I think that's a great transition into the uh, quarantine pay and the essential worker pay. Okay. So, I appreciate you all. I will be off video. I'm going to join you via phone in a couple minutes. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank Brian, you. for picking up my slack here, and Veronica for leading this part of it. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, Veronica, I, I guess I'm looking to you and perhaps Brian Elliott, but I actually sure. honestly don't know exactly if we could just set a little bit of context. What is essential worker pay and what is quarantine pay and what is the difference between the two? Yes, I'm going to let Brian kind of talk about what it is and what's moving at the state, what the conversation is at the state level. And then I can add on to, OK, so what are we thinking at the city, if that seems like it makes sense? Because other than that, I feel like the pieces around the Downtown Workers Council I've I've already named, and this is like the one uh, major outstanding piece. So I will hand it over to, to Brian Elliott. OK, thanks. So um, the, the short story is that the state is getting 2.8 I don't know, 8 billion Last I heard, and the city, for example, is getting $280.5 million from the American Rescue Plan. Those will be coming in two tranches, um, definitely for the cities and probably for the state as well. Um, and so, you know, like $140 million for the next couple of years, the city's getting. And the priority we have at both the state and, state and city and county levels um, is to the extent possible getting money into the pockets of those frontline workers who were uh, unable to telework, who, who were facing uh, higher risks throughout this entire pandemic and who never received any 
sort of hazard pay. Um, and uh, in particular, the focus we've had is around um, emergency leave that uh, that the, you know, we have members who've, you know, burned through their PTO because they had to quarantine and then were on unpaid leave for weeks. We had, you know, uh, and so we're focused on trying to figure out how to pay for this using the rescue plan dollars, the treasury guidance that we have been anxiously awaiting for five or six weeks came out um, four hours ago, maybe. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of us around this, this country right now going through the 151 pages of that uh, interim final rule by the U.S. Treasury Department. And, you know, it's it's really clear and easy language, of course, as you would expect. I'm kidding. Uh, it's really dense and, and complicated. So um, the so the, there's a couple of pieces. One is the policy piece, which seems to be a lot clearer. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, if, if the and if the state doesn't do this because of the Republicans in the Senate who have been rather intransigent, um, it may be something we need to do at the city level. The easy part is to acknowledge that private employers with fewer than 500 employees have always, since the start of the pandemic, and continue to be eligible to for a dollar for dollar tax credit to pay their workers for COVID-related leave, right? So there is, but the problem is that it was only a requirement on those private businesses through the end of 2020. So starting on January 1, it was no longer required. And so for, we have employers that, you know, cause now also with the passage of the rescue plan starting on April 1st, all public employers could also access this tax credit to provide this leave to their employees. And we have school districts in other parts of the state, for example, who are like, yeah, I know we could get a dollar for dollar tax credit. And yeah, I know we wouldn't even have to wait to get that tax credit because we just pay less payroll tax. That's how the tax credit works. So you don't even have to like it's not an outlay. You're not waiting to get it. It's immediate. Um, yeah, I know we get these things, but, you know, I don't think we're going to offer it, which is so much bullshit. I can't even believe it because it's literally a dollar for dollar tax credit. And they say, oh, but we just want people to get vaccinated. Well, if you want people to get vaccinated, maybe you should pay them to take the time off to get vaccinated and deal with any recovery or symptoms resulting from that vaccination. So. Um, we need to make sure that this is a requirement, if not statewide, then at the very least within the city of Minneapolis, with people working in the city of Minneapolis, that these are required. Like, you, you're getting a dollar for dollar credit for this. Give me a break. And then the problem, of course, is that there are workers, either private employer, private employees of employers with 500 or more workers, so your largest employers, many of whom have been offering this, by the way. We had a, uh, a member who's a home care worker testify that while she couldn't get any time off, her 17-year-old who works at Target had no problem getting quarantine pay because they were like, yeah, sure, you got you need to quarantine, we'll pay you for two weeks. So, um, but anyway, there is no money or requirement for big private corporations. And... Under the federal law, you can still exclude healthcare workers and first responders, even if you otherwise would have had to offer it to all of your other employees. So, nurses, med techs, you know, anyone, basically anyone who's working in a hospital or clinic and uh, first responders, your paramedics and police, et cetera. They, you know, cities, counties, states, they could all just say, private employers could just say no. So we have to get rid of that 
um, that ability to deny this leave. And then comes the funding. And this is what we're still trying to figure out is how do we pay for this if, in fact, uh, there is an expect if there is an expectation that large employers won't do this without some sort of uh, incentive. And this is one of those rare cases where I'm like, yeah, let's throw money at big employers because in this case, I know that 100 percent of those dollars are going into the pockets of these frontline essential workers. Right. So. In this one case, I'm okay with this, uh, this approach. So it's something that I think the city is going to need to act on if it does not pass the legislature. It is something that is urgent because you can't undeny leave that has been denied in the past. It's not like you can, you know, someone says, oh, I needed leave back in January, but my employer didn't give it to me. Well, that's 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 in the past now. You can't like get that leave now. So the longer we wait, the more people are being denied this leave and are unable to take advantage of it. And so it, and the tax credit expires at the end of September. So this is an urgent thing that if the legislature doesn't act in the next couple of weeks, um, we really need the city to act on. So I'm going to stop talking there. Um, yeah, I mean, Brian was pretty clear. Um, and that is, yes, it we absolutely absolutely need to move this on a city level as well. Um, and want to start some conversations with council members about, you know, obviously we need to <clears throat> there are things we need to wait for to see what happened on the state level during session. Um, but starting those conversations to make sure that we can move this if we need to on a city level. And that's something that's um, been since the beginning a really critically important thing for the Downtown Workers Council. And and let's be honest, if it's too complicated for some larger employers to look back and figure this out um, and they don't have access to a tax credit, the American Rescue Plan also allows the money that is going to cities to be used for premium pay for essential workers. And that pay, according to the rule that came out today, can be retroactive. So, um, you know, we wouldn't want to, I don't, I wouldn't want to spend the city money on a tax credit that's available from a totally different pot of money. Like, let's spend the discretionary money on things that the feds aren't paying for in a different way. But, but if there's a way to get money in the pockets, uh, if it's not through emergency leave, then we should really be thinking about um, premium pay for these frontline workers. Brian, this is Kate Davenport. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, um, I'm just, I think I'm following everything that you've said. Um, I, first off, it's just like shocking to me that people don't use SFCRA. Um, but, um, so if you're an employer that has been providing some of these benefits, has been providing hazard pay, mm -hmm then you're kind of left holding the bag in terms of basically then other employers that haven't are going to get off scot-free. That's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm hoping to avoid. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I, mean, I would never take was... back to the fact that we paid hazard pay, but like if one of our competitors didn't and then their employees are getting hazard pay and they're not on the hook, that's going to make the small business community. Yeah. So the, the way that the uh, emergency leave bill is written at the state level, um, it would recognize everyone who offer, it would credit everyone who had offered the leave, including large businesses that weren't eligible for the tax credit as having met the Got requirement. It. So that that's- Sorry, I, I just had a kid talk, so. <laughs> I'm muted myself. Um, sure. Okay. Do you know if you may not know this yet, but like for example, um, Eureka did as well as I know other businesses. Like FFCRA in some cases wasn't enough. Somebody might, you know, may have needed to be yep. off for COVID symptoms for more than two weeks. Yep. You know if it, and so we covered that in addition to the FFCRA. Do you know if it speaks to that at all? Because it's too early to tell. This. 
state bill um, only requires the um, what is the what is basically what is essentially offered by as a tax credit under the FFCR under FICRA and the ARP. The the rescue plan added another two weeks starting on April 1st. It sort of reset the clock. So anyone who hadn't used their full two weeks, just everyone just started fresh at two weeks on April 1st. Um, but neither the American Rescue Plan nor the state bill address uh, anyone who uh, any employer who went beyond the uh, previously the requirements for small private small and mid-sized private employers of under a hundred um, that isn't addressed in either the state bill or in in the rescue plan. Okay, thanks. Yep. And you know, again, the 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 whole idea of premium pay is still something that until today, we had no idea what would or wouldn't be allowed. And as I said, I'm still working my way through the um, federal interim final rule uh, from the US Treasury Department uh, to figure out uh, if, if there is yet enough clarity to understand how premium pay could be used or deployed. Hey Brian, quick question: Are you in your uh, when you're talking about these and in, in terms of the city work, right? Not necessarily the state bill right now, but mm -hmm. um, are you thinking retroactive for both? Um, with you know, I've, as we were just talking about the tax credits for the smaller businesses, get a bit complicated, right? Um, if it were the premium pay or the emergency leave. Is your thought that both would be retroactive or the, the emergency leave would be going forward given the tax credits and the and the premium pay would be retroactive? Of course, that depends on the federal guidance to some extent, but what are your thoughts around that so yeah, in terms of what you've this, been talking about? Yeah, at least the way that the state bill is currently drafted, it is retroactive um, just for everyone. Yeah. Um, both for public employers and in private employers, regardless of, of size or whether they had access to the the leave. Um, don't know if that answers your question. I don't know what the, you know, it, a lot of this is currently being worked on. And I think a lot of what we would be bringing to the city would be based on sort of how all of this is shaping up at the, because we're able to have these conversations beforehand at the cap, you know, before us, the city is considering this, we're having these conversations at the Capitol. So I don't know if that clarifies much, but. Yeah, and, and I, if I recall the American Rescue Plan early on, and again, the guidance just came out today, as you said, but um, they had the line in there about premium pay as sort of setting up a, a grant program, like you said, right? It's funding and sort of a pass through, depending if that would go through an administration like a state or a city, I guess, obviously we'd have, that's to be determined in the guidance or how that works. I don't know if there was any more and you haven't seen it yet today, if it would be something other than that, uh, a, a, you know, an application, you can, you know, you put it in either the employer or the worker who would qualify would put in an application and then the money would be available to in a form or was both there something those, else you were thinking? So both of those mechanisms are allowed in the guidance that came out today. They could either be grants to employers to pass through money to their essential workers, or they could be payments directly to essential workers. The how would need to be determined by the by the state or city or county that was using their money to to do that. Um, there are some other limits. Uh, the, you know, there's um, basically the the guidance says if you want to, if the premium pay would put any worker above a certain amount relative to where you are geographically in the country, uh, mm -hmm. that you'd have to provide addition, the, the city or county or state would need to provide additional reasoning as to why they would give premium pay to someone who was already making uh in Minnesota, I think it's like in the metro area, I think it's like $45 an hour is what that yeah. 
that limit would be. So it's pretty, you know, it's pretty high. Um, but you know, the, the, they also said again, that you can do it retroactively. There are, there is guidance on who, uh, could be included in that, but the, the chief executive, so the mayor or the, in, or the governor have a lot of authority to determine who is essential for the purposes of that premium pay. Yeah. Two states did this last year. Um, and one was a pass through grant and one set it up and um, healthcare workers and others, as you mentioned, were part of it. And, you know, the funding, the amount um, and how you set those parameters, you know, they didn't reach enough people, I guess, was the outcome of what from that one, you know, so um, it, it's just interesting that the pass through grant and using that money and one time money, you know, and, and mm -hmm. in terms of the authority um it's it's the parameters to make sure that you're getting it to the workers that you want to get it you know like you said yep. who how big is the pool because one program worked you know not pretty well overall and it was a pass-through grant and the other program um again targeted more towards smaller businesses and medium but they they ran out of funds quickly mm -hmm. yep you know? and I, I i'm aware of those and the the my assumption had always been that this would be grants to employers um but again the guidance allows for both yeah okay so brian am i following this correctly that the idea that um that you and others are talking about at the capitol is using american rescue plan money to pay for hazard pay or, or premium pay for frontline workers. And I think I'm following that that would potentially be retroactive. And then separately, you're talking about um, the issue of paid sick leave or paid emergency COVID leave. Um, are you also talking about subsidizing that with American Rescue Plan money? I, I got a little bit lost on that. Sure. Um, I think, so the idea is that, um, we probably don't want to spend our discretionary dollars on something that the feds are covering from another bucket that is not discretionary. Um, and right now, um, all private employers under 500 employees could get a tax credit for up to 10 days of leave for their workers. And uh, public employers had to do this, even though they weren't getting any money through the end of 2020. And then uh, starting on April 1st of this year, they also get that tax credit. Right, right. So, so where, what's, the, what's the new idea in, in addition to the FFCRA, the federal coronavirus leave There's that you're the describing? What's the there's the policy pieces that I mentioned at the start because it's not required anymore, even for those who do have access to a tax credit. And we think that it should be my organization does. And I know we've been talking with Vero that it should be required at the very least for those organizations who have access to a dollar for dollar tax credit. Um, because you know, as Kate said, they're doing great stuff. A lot of most employers are, but we, as I, as I mentioned, also we we also do have employers even uh, that have uh, workers in a union who are saying, "Yeah, we don't have to. I don't think we're gonna." So okay. there's that piece of it. the The big question mark is what happens with the federal dollars and what happens with, you know, so if we are requiring sick, uh, re uh, retroactive or proactive either way leave, we, we want to make sure that we're not replacing that federal tax money, the tax credit with discretionary dollars. We don't want to replace that, right? We want people to take advantage of this other pot of money mm -hmm. um 
And then there's this whole question of employers of 500 or more because they've never been required. A lot of organizations like Target, as I mentioned, uh, have been doing really like they've been a shining example in this. Um, but there are a lot of employers like my uh, my members, uh, employers in you know janitorial or security or in healthcare where they were allowed to exclude that most of their workers um, that have just never had an opportunity to have uh, this paid leave and have, have you know really struggled quite frankly um, because they've had to quarantine oftentimes at the um, at the direction of their employer because they were exposed at work and they still weren't getting paid because they didn't have COVID. A lot of employers have provided leave for people who actually were, were po COVID positive, but even there, not all employers did that. But if they just had to quarantine because they were waiting a test result or anything like that, they, uh, a lot of employers didn't end up paying their, their, their employees for that. Got it. Well, I think I actually I followed all of that and I appreciate um, the questions and the, the comments from 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 uh, Elise and and others. Um, what if my final question, I promise is Brian, what's the like process wise? Where where are you at at the Capitol and, and how can folks kind of follow along? Sure. So the provision uh, for emergency leave is included in the House Workforce and, and Labor Budget Bill, or Budget and Policy Bill. It is absent from the Senate's version of that bill. So right now, the conference committee is meeting most mornings, um, and they they and so that's one of that's one place that this could get worked out the uh, other also very likely scenario is that items like this where there is that that both involve recovery plan or rescue plan or rather dollars and that are so divergent in terms of the policy between the house and the senate because the house passed it and the senate passed nothing like it um, that those could actually also end up in the leadership discussions, which none of us are unfortunately really able to follow because those are happening with uh, the speaker, the Senate Majority Leader, and the mm -hmm. governor, and those are, are not public discussions. Okay. Does anyone else have any thoughts or um, reactions or questions or comments or... Concerns. It's exciting. Um, a lot moving and a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving parts, a lot of different levels of government overlapping and trying to figure some big, some big um, problems out. Veronica, did you want to add in anything from the downtown worker council, how you fit in? Yeah, no, I mean, just really in thinking about the city level, um, you know, and then the state level. I think workers from a number of the different organizations have been weighing in and testifying and um, and such, but uh, but are now thinking about what needs to move at a city level and how do we start that conversation. Great. Great. Well, the only other item that this we is, have, Chelsea, sorry. the other oh, the other thing that I'm interested in is like the education factor about this because I don't know that employees know to ask their employers about it. So can that be included in the education and outreach work that the department is already doing? Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the department let uh, the, you're talking to me, the Department of Civil Rights, and can we um, be mindful of the federal law and to help lift it up and the fact that it's optional, but workers should know about it and ask for it, things like that? Yes. Got it. Yeah, um, yes, 
Yes, and um, that's actually something that a point that Gia has raised to me recently and wants to help lift up some of that messaging as best we can. And um, I've been working on some some new materials that we have up on our website and we're going to try our best to share out to all of you and to the sort of public at large. Because yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. There, there's just so many different moving pieces and it gets really complicated really quickly. So to um, expect a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a worker, uh, everyday worker who's busy to try to figure this all out and piece it all together is, is in a lot of time, a lot of cases kind of unrealistic. Especially when you have multiple jurisdictions involved, you have city, state and federal and everyone has different pro uh, protections and leave protections and how do they all fit together. Um, it is really complicated, so that's part of the challenge I think that we that we're facing. Um, the only other thing that we have on the agenda is just to kind of flat. I don't know that we need to dive into a deep discussion here and it's 511, so we're coming towards the end of the meeting. But just to flag the city budget, of course, it kind of never ends. And it, uh, I, I think, um, I imagine is starting, this is not, you know, not something I'm involved in directly, but is I imagine starting to discussions starting with department heads and uh, in the mayor's office, et cetera. And I know that folks in this committee are always um, keen to weigh into some of that decision making. So just sort of wanted to flag it for everyone. And I don't know if, if anyone has any particular thoughts on that piece. I do. Um, so, and you know, this is something that the, that this, committee has weighed in on every year, but particularly thinking about the budget um, for Civil Rights Department, the budget for LSED specifically. Um, and so I think that, I mean, I just, you know, like I, I was mentioning this before, but just to kind of put a finer point on it is that like what we've learned over the last two years is that when workers don't know about their rights, um, when they don't know about like the basic rights to protect them at work, then in a crisis hits, they're in a pretty terrible situation. And so how can we prevent that from happening? How can we make sure that those crises would like when crises hit, workers are prepared because there's the big global crisis like a pandemic, but then there's all the mini crises that happen every day for workers um, because of actions of because of the economy or because of actions of their employer or because of life. Um, but I, I just think that it's critically important to make sure after what we've seen over this last couple of years, that we just need to invest more in making sure that we've got enough investigators to actually do the work um, and enforce workers' rights and that we have enough money and community contracts to make sure that the most vulnerable workers that we know have been traditionally low-wage uh, low workers, minimum-wage workers, and workers of color are, are getting the information that they need um, and the resources they need to be able to act if they're facing problems in the workplace. So. I want to, you know, I don't, I don't have a particular like number that I'm putting out there today, but increasing that capacity, I think, is just such a basically critically important piece of infrastructure that we have to make sure we have in place. So that's that's my piece on that. Especially since we're like, you know, now there's now there's the wage theft, you know, law. There's like, st and you know, we haven't really added capacity since since that. Great. Well, maybe we will add, unless anyone else wants, please anyone else kind of chime in here, but maybe we will add that, um, keep that on the agenda for the coming months so that you can all um, think about how or in what way you want to you wanna advocate. I would love to uh, jump in and piggyback off of that a little bit too. Um, one of the... Um, big reasons that I wanted to be involved with this committee is um, the enforcement of our adult entertainment ordinance. And we're definitely looking to establish a relationship with the city similarly, similarly to the way Say Tool did um, and to do co-enforcement of our ordinance as well and um, making that legislation like live in the world. And we've definitely hit a bunch of um, hurdles along the way and <laughs> are like, 
really looking to gain as much support as possible. And we're meeting with the mayor tomorrow to ask. And I would, if anyone has any guidance to give me, I would, I'm super open to it. Did you do your, to, to ask the mayor for what specifically? Um, to like fund swap to do co-enforcement of our adult entertainment ordinance. That's exciting. I don't have any specific advice and nor I don't even know if that would be appropriate for me to have advice for you, but that's exciting, Andy. Good for you. And thanks for being at this meeting. Um, and I know um, you sort of alluded to um, to uh, some challenges that in rolling out the adult uh, entertainment protection ordinance or whatever the official well, name of it is. What are, you, what are you calling it? Is that it? Did I get that? Adult entertainment ordinance. The adult entertainment ordinance. Okay. Yeah. I I know that um, Andy Andy has been doing some incredible, just for the, for the sake of everyone on the call, Andy has been doing some incredible work around that. Um, and she and her colleagues lost a real champion in the, um, not the health department. Who? Um, business licensing. Linda business Rockett. licensing. Right, right. Business licensing. I, I'm always. I work more with health. Um, business license. You lost a real champion. Someone that had really like helped um, create the ordinance in the first place, or really had worked with you all along. Um, and I and the pandemic hit. Um, so there was a lot of mo momentum, kind of lost or or. Yeah, lost, uh, snuffed out in 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 what you have been working on all along. So um, good luck in your meeting, and there's definitely a lot of progress to be made there. Yeah, definitely. I'm really excited, and I'm even more excited to work with every, a lot of people on this call have worked with me on this <laughs> ordinance project all along too. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited for tomorrow. So I guess just. Uh, Send me good vibes tomorrow. <laughs> Will do. If you want to come to this meeting again next month and update everyone around your work, I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, with that, I will just pause and slowly say goodbye unless anyone wants to cut me off or jump in with anything else. Going once. Chelsea, do you want to say any parting, parting words? No, it's great. No, thank you for helping to facilitate the end of this. And I agree, every month is budget month. So um, thanks, Veronica. You did a really great job articulating why we need to just keep pushing and make that a priority. So every month is budget month. Andy, I'm going to call you tomorrow or the day after. Follow up. I'll put a plug in for you as well. So <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Every month is budget month. I'm gonna write that. I'm gonna write that one down. Nobody forget that one. Brian, did you hear that? Budget month. All right, guys. Thank, thanks, nice, everyone. Thanks. So <laughs> good. Go to, so good to see you and hear you. Have a good uh, month or or day. <laughs> thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Brian.